Hello everyone, welcome back to the Stack Enterprises YouTube channel and in today's video we're going to be discussing life insurance, everybody's favorite topic. Now whether you are here planning for the future, trying to protect your family, or just curious about your options, you are in the right spot. Uh, we're, today we're actually going to be diving into a puzzling question that many have. Should I have term insurance or should I have permanent insurance? I know it's a big decision so I want to make sure I clear up any questions that you may have on that subject. And not only that, we're going to explore how deciding to wait to purchase your insurance could significantly impact your wallet. I've got a comparison tool which we'll break down in today's video. Um, and then if you're wondering how much insurance do I actually need, we're going to go over three common methods and we're going to do a deep dive in the third one, the needs analysis approach to help tailor a plan that fits your life perfectly. And then lastly, we'll wrap up with the 10 most common questions that I have within my office about life insurance and how it works. So let's begin. First things first, let's talk about what term insurance is and permanent insurance. Uh, term insurance and guaranteed universal life are the two that I'm going to compare in today's video. You may have heard of whole life insurance. Um, those do have some cash values that can be built inside of them. They tend to be more expensive than what I'm going to be putting on the screen today. So just wanted to give that disclosure from the get go. Um, but if you're comparing the two, so term insurance, it is like renting an apartment um, is a good analogy that I heard of the other day. So you are going to be renting that insurance on your life for a certain period of time that could be 10 years 20 years 30 years it just depends on how long you want that coverage to last forward um, it's going to be very straightforward <clears throat> and it's going to be very affordable compared to permanent insurance which i'll dive into here in just a moment um, the primary purpose of in uh, term insurance is to offer financial perfection protection for the dependents during your working years for most individuals so for example, you'll want to make sure you have money set aside to cover expenses of debts, education, um, living expenses for you if you were the primary breadwinner and we're no longer here to pay the bills for the family. That is what term insurance is used for. Most generally it's used for the working individual. Retirees in the event they're considering estate planning and legacy planning, that's where they might dip into these guaranteed universal life policies, but we'll get into that again here in just a moment. <clears throat> again, term insurance is kind of like paying rent. You are going to be in there for a certain period of time, and then after that period of time, you're no longer going to have coverage on your life. So for example, if you were to pick the perfect day that you were going to pass away, if you own term insurance, it would be the day before your term policy ended. Because if you passed away two days after your term, the insurance company is no longer obligated to make a death benefit payment because you passed away outside of that period term. Um, now guaranteed universal life, it's more of a permanent insurance policy. So most of these, you can guarantee that the premiums will not change up to certain ages. Um, in most cases, it's going to be most often up to 100 or even all the way up to 121 if you wanted to be super conservative with your uh, assessments and your quotes that you're looking at. Um, but it does not really focus on building cash value inside of it. Um, so it's kind of the middle ground between a whole life policy that I mentioned earlier and a term policy. It's a policy that you're going to get a guaranteed death benefit when you die, as long as you die between now and age 100 or 121 or whatever your expiration is on that policy. Um, it's very similar to term and how it pays out. And it, it is most often used for, again, estate planning or leaving a legacy behind. So, you know, you have a guaranteed X amount of dollars you want to leave. Um, so in summary, term is for, again, trying to the trying to help protect the working individual's family, whereas guaranteed or permanent policies tend to be most often used for legacy stake or tax planning if you have that situation come up down the road as well. Now, I like to give a comparison of what the different rates are for different individuals. So as of right now, these are just shooting from the hip. I ran through a quoting tool for individuals in my area at age 25, 30, 35, etc. These are going to represent male and female monthly premiums. And both of these policies are going to be for one, a quarter million of death benefit or 250,000. So in this first column, for example, a 25 year old that was tw that wanted a 20 year term policy to protect themselves for a quarter million would run approximately $20 a month for a male and $17 a month for a female. Now, those premiums are going to be fixed, not ever go up or down for the certain 20 year period inside of this policy. So <clears throat> that's something that you should take a note of inside of term policies. The premiums tend to stay the same. For sake of this example, I'm going to use a quarter million guaranteed to age 100 permanent policy for the same 25 year old male. That would run them approximately $93 a month and a female would run approximately $80 a month. So a 4X multiplier on the cost, but 
the reason why is the likelihood of you dying between now and 100 is almost guaranteed, whereas the likelihood of a 25-year-old dying in the next 20 years is very, very small, so they don't have as much risk per se. And that's why you see the adjustment in these types of premiums, whether it's a term policy or a permanent policy, is because the risk for the insurance company is significantly lower on a term policy. Um, but you'll notice as you get older, things do tend to get more and more expensive. So you can see the difference from a 50 to 55 to 60 year old on the monthly premium cost. That is because again, the risk of somebody, a 60 year old, for example, passing away by age 80 is much higher than what it is for a 40 or excuse me, a 25 year old to pass away by age 45. Um, and then females again on the right hand side, women tend to be less expensive for insurance sake, unless we're talking about long-term care, which I can make a different video on in the future. But uh, women do tend to outlive men, the general vast uh, majority of the population. Plus um, it is generally conceived that women are not as risky as men. So they are not as likely to have their life on the line whenever situations come up. Um, but again, I just wanted to show this comparison breakdown of the cost of waiting. So if you are in your late forties or early fifties, those tend to be the prime time to start thinking about life insurance for a legacy planning stake. And a lot of individuals will do a blend of the two. So somebody might say they want to leave a guaranteed hundred thousand behind to their one child, um, but they might need half a million dollars in coverage now. So what they might do is go buy $400,000 of term insurance and $100,000 of permanent insurance to make sure that they're meeting both of those goals. Um, so next thing we're going to dive into is we're going to be looking at how much life insurance do I need? Three different ways that you can use for a general rule of thumb on determining how much insurance coverage you should consider carrying on your life. Speak with a licensed insurance representative or somebody who can help you with these sub or subjects in the event it is something important to you. Um, but the income replacement method, this tends to be the easiest. I would say it is a good solution for you. I do like the dime formula and the needs analysis better and the best one for the needs analysis, but I'll go into this one first. So let's imagine that you make $50,000 a year and you are wanting to make sure that you have income to support your family in the event of your death for the next 10 years. It's a simple math formula. Multiply your annual income times 10 years of income, how much would you need? You would need $500,000 life insurance policy. Very easy, straightforward, easy to get yourself some general quotes and to give you an idea as to what your out-of-pocket expenses might be. Now, <clears throat> the dime formula goes a step further. It's going to take into consideration your debt, your income, your mortgages, and your education. So more or less, what we're going to do is we're going to add up all of your debt, all of your income, all of your what you have on your mortgage or your secondary properties, if you own any, and your education expenses. You're going to add up all of those together and you're going to come up with a lump sum, which would be approximately how much life insurance you would need. So comparing apples to apples of these two income replacements only going to take into consideration your income, whereas the dime formula is going to take into consideration paying off debts in the event of your in the event of your death unexpectedly. So the family is not going to have a mortgage anymore. Um, they're going to have a certain number of years of income available to you. They're not going to have any debt from those credit cards or whatever it may be, or any student loans that they're going to have to pay off on your behalf either. Um, the last method, which I think is the best method, it's what I'm most familiar with in my office, is a needs analysis method, where you're more or less going to go through what your current living expenses are, your future living expenses, your retirement goals, your estate planning goals, your tax planning, and even your family situation and lifestyle changes that you would suspect in the event of one of the parents passing away in a traditional family. So I'm going to break down a needs analysis method a little bit further in the next slide. Here is an example of a breakdown of a needs analysis scenario so you can have a better idea as to what that means. Um, so let's assume for sake, this is a case study. This is not a real live world situation. So please take that into consideration whenever we're looking at this information. But let's assume John at age 35 and his spouse Jane, 34, have two children who are five and eight years old. John is the primary breadwinner earning 60,000 a year while Jane works part-time working 20 or making 20,000 per year. So for current living expenses, let's assume that they need to make $50,000 collectively to cover their mortgage, their utilities, their groceries and transportation. Um, in the event John were to pass away, Jane might still be able to cover some of the expenses with her income, but she would not be able to cover all of them with her current part-time status. Um, future living expenses we would consider would be um, the children are likely to attend college in about 10 to 15 years. They're estimating they're going to need about $100,000 towards the student loans for each of those children that they want to make sure they pay for them. Um, they do have retirement goals as well. They don't plan to work forever. So their current 
Um, yearly contributions are about 5,000 annually to retirement accounts. So to ensure that Jane could still meet the retirement goals without John's contributions, they might want to add an additional $100,000 to life insurance to invest for Jane's future self. For estate planning sake, John and Jane want to leave $50,000 to each child in all instances. That's where they would want to consider adding another $100,000 of death benefit on John's life. For tax planning, after consulting with their tax advisor, they estimate that they're going to need estate taxes and some other costs that would be approximately another $50,000. And for the family's situation and lifestyle changes, considering the need for additional child care and potential loss of income due to the emotional impact, they estimate maybe $100,000 would be a good, uh, good target for Jane in that circumstance if John was to pass away early. So summing it all up, if we add in all of these expenses, this puts their total estimated need at closer to a million dollars in John and Jane's hypothetical scenario here. Um, because again, you're adding up all of the current living expenses, the future living expenses, the retirement goals, estate planning goals, tax planning, and family situation, plus the lifestyle transition monies that are needed or necessary. So I hope that is a good example of a needs analysis breakdown. I think these are the best and most accurate ways to consider determining if you need life insurance in the first way, in the first place. And if you do need life insurance, how much life insurance you should consider purchasing on yourself. This can also help break down whether this million dollars should be just term insurance or whether a combination of it should be term and permanent insurance. For example, they might want to put 150 or 200,000 of this as permanent insurance for the goals of the leaving a, a little bit of legacy to the children behind, plus the estate planning taxes and fees that they're considering might be applicable to their scenario. But since we've gone through this, let's now dive into the 10 most commonly asked questions about life insurance. We can get this video wrapped up for the day. All right. These are going to be rapid fire, but I want to make sure I get the information over to you. So do you ne really need life insurance? The question is not a simple yes or no answer. It's a lot of it's going to be depending on, do you have dependents who rely on your income? Do you have any individuals that are relying on your financial security in order to have the lifestyle that they want in the event of your passing? Would you be negatively affecting them with you no longer being here to help them out? So I think that's a question that most of us can answer. If you have a family, you can most often argue that life insurance could be a useful tool for the family to help offset your income needs or any expenses you may have racked up while you're on this planet with us. Um, now, how do you buy life insurance? I always suggest finding a reputable insurance agent or company. That's kind of a no brainer. I know you can do a lot of quoting online. Be conscious and be aware of those outfits and their credibility and what they're able to do on the life insurance side of things for payout situations. Um, I've heard of many scams on the web right now, unfortunately, with individuals buying term life insurance because it's something super cheap and affordable for most individuals. But the insurance company that they were working with is no longer it, they were never a legitimate company in the first place, so they just paid a premium for nothing, unfortunately. Um, so make sure you find a reputable insurance agent or company we can help out with in our office or find somebody local or online that you can talk with on a one-on-one -on -one basis to help determine how much insurance you need in the first place, too. Um, so another question that's asked is, what is a free look period and how does that work? Um, it's usually a 10 to 30 day window after receiving your policy in hand that you can change your mind on if you decided you needed the insurance in the first place. So let's say you made your first premium payment and you decided 20 days later you wanted to change your mind, 20 days after you were delivered your policy, they can refund you your premium and you can send back your policy and you would not have any coverage on your life. But again, all we spent was the time and effort and energy to get the policy in, first, in the force in the first place, but you shouldn't have anything held against you per se. Another question that's asked is, is it true that some life insurance companies won't turn down applications? Yes, this is true. There are insurance uh, policies called guaranteed issue. Most of the time, these policies are going to have a much higher premium with limited coverage, especially within the first couple years of the policy. And the reason why is because they want to make insurance available to all individuals. They just have to make sure that it is an affordable policy for the insurance carrier who is issuing it, because if they just signed up anybody and everybody for any premium whatsoever, without some certain limitations on the policies, the insurance company would not be able to conduct business and provide the payouts to the insureds that are paying them their premiums for those policies. Uh, another common question, does life insurance cover accidental death? Yes, most insurance policies do cover accidental death. However, there may be some exclusions. So for example, I have been skydiving a couple times in my lifetime. Um, some insurance carriers will not cover a death benefit claim in the event that it was 
because you jumped willingly out of a plane on your own, for example. So just make sure that you're reading the policy exclusions to ask those questions about what unique situations do you have that come up in your life? You want to make sure you're covered in the event you do have an accident happening during those situations. So make sure you're reading the fine print on those policies. Okay, another question is what does a fully paid up false policy mean on a permanent life insurance policy? So it means that no further premiums, premium payments are required to keep the policy in force. Where this comes up most common, commonly is if you have an individual who is maybe in their prime working years, let's assume an individual is 50 years old and they want to retire by the age of 60. What they might purchase is a permanent life insurance policy that have a, has a certain period of time that they pay premiums in and they stop at a certain period in the future because it's essentially paid up. Um, so an example of this, that 50 year old decides that they want to buy a quarter million dollar premium uh, guaranteed life insurance policy that's a 10 pay premium. It means that they're going to pay premiums in for the next 10 years. After 10 years, they're no longer going to continue those because they do not plan to be working and have the extra income available to make those premium payments. Um, so the insurance company would adjust their premiums upward from what it would have been if he made a monthly premium for the rest of his life to age 100, for example, to help offset that difference so he can again have a paid up policy. Um, I have been asked this before as well. Can I have multiple life insurance policies? You can have as many life insurance policies as insurance companies will accept on you. And what I mean by that is you are not tied to only having one life insurance policy with one insurance carrier at one entity. You can have as many of them as out there as humanly possible. Now, most of the time, insurance companies will want to, they will be asking you if you have applied for or if you have any other official life insurance policies on your life. You would want to be truthful with those questions and answers um, to the insurance companies because some insurance companies may have limitations on what you could and uh, what, how much life insurance you could have on your life based off of your income and your needs analysis and everything else like that. Um, can I change my life insurance policy later on? It depends on the policy type. So there are some convertible term policies, which would allow you to convert that term into a permanent policy down the road. Now you may have to undergo some underwriting or a medical exam to make sure you are still insurable by the insurance company. But yes, there are certain types of insurance policies, which can be changed on your life down the road as well. Couple more quick questions, last two. What if you miss a premium payment? So policies do usually have a grace period. If your premium, and that normally is about 30 days. So let's assume your premium was due on November 14th of 2023, and you did not pay that premium on time. You're then gonna fall within that grace period. Now, each insurance carrier may have a different grace period, so you'll wanna check with them, but most of the time that grace period may fall with anywhere from two weeks to four weeks, or maybe the end of the month. Um, but at that point, the insurance company would accept your premium in most instances, so your policy does not lapse or go out of force. But you would want to make sure you get in touch with the insurance carrier as humanly fast as possible once you determine that you have missed your premium payment on that. All right, lastly, are life insurance payouts taxable? Generally, they are not taxable. This, is, this can be very, very useful in estate and legacy planning if you're th thinking about the tax considerations that the beneficiary may receive on the assets that you leave behind for them after you're no longer here. Um, also, in the event you have a larger estate, there are a lot of permanent policies that are used to help offset estate taxes if you have a, an entity or a family that maybe is worth more than 26, 27 million as of 2023, 2024 estate um, tax limits. So those were 10 of the commonly asked questions that we get or that we have asked within my office about life insurance. We discussed not only that, but we discussed what are the differences between term and permanent insurance? What are some of the costs of waiting and how much life insurance do you need? Um, so I hope today's video was very useful and helpful. Um, in the event you did derive value from this video, please consider liking it and sharing it with somebody else who may benefit from the information. Otherwise, I will see you guys next week. Thank you for your time and have a great day. Thanks.